I kept seeing these dried up lily bulbs at pet stores, which piqued my curiosity. I had to know if they could grow. To discover the answer, I crafted an ecosystem around them within a glass box over 200 days ago. To my surprise, what began as a simple experiment took on a life of its own and became a mini world sustaining life in the balance. Creatures and plants unexpectedly emerged, families long separated were reunited, friendships were formed, and the lily bulbs, well, only time would tell. This experiment began earlier this year when I built a custom aquarium using glass shelves from Ikea. No, I'm not kidding. It's an easy and cost-effective process that I have an extensive tutorial about. I'll put the link for that in the video description if you want to learn more. It only took about 10 minutes to construct the tank because the glass works right out of the packaging. However, I couldn't add the finishing touches until the following day. The result was a sleek 25 gallon aquarium. The perfect footprint to establish a thriving aquatic environment revolving around the lily bulbs, but I didn't know if they'd grow. Instead, I had to peer into the future and imagine what a design around them could look like. A specific concept came to mind, a fallen rotten tree surrounded by lily pads and stems. Cork bark fit that vision perfectly, so the path forward was clear. Creating such a feature wouldn't be possible without dramatic modifications. It had to appear broken and degraded in the center, and just cutting it in half wasn't enough. Roughing the edges was essential to make it appear as believable as possible. I also don't like wasting things, and I knew the scraps could be used for another project. Cork typically isn't used in aquariums because of its buoyancy. Other types can be weighed down simply with a screw and slate stone. That wasn't a viable option here, but wire was a good alternative. Regardless of the type of wood, it's extremely helpful to calculate how much weight is required to keep it submerged before doing anything. There's nothing worse than assembling a scape only for the wood to float and ruin your hard work. When I considered how lilies grow, I decided to add branches. I imagined their stems weaving around them, which could look pretty dynamic. However, none of this was permanent. I was simply experimenting to gain inspiration. Water lilies require a fertile substrate to grow well. I didn't want the setup to have a continuous layer, so I made substrate bags to contain and conceal it beneath other materials. These would determine where I'd add the bulbs. So, based on them and the rough scape from before, I considered the growth patterns while laying the foundation. Their roots would find the nutrients regardless, but proximity to the bags was optimal. Attempting to recreate the previous scape one for one would have been pointless. Instead, I made something new around its essence. The river rocks were a part of that design, but now they would provide anchor points for branches that otherwise would float. I felt this wasn't time to reinvent the wheel, and my focus was on creating a simple layout that would maintain focus on the plants I hoped would grow. That said, a few additional details made it all appear seamless and harmonious. As I reviewed it from afar, I couldn't help but feel like something was missing. Now that's better. Since this was a tank intended to focus on lilies, that's where I began. I had the dried out bulbs and a few established ones in case the others failed. They wouldn't be the only plants though. I knew that green foliage would enhance their appearance and the entire design. I was excited to see the layout complete and curious how this experiment would transpire. I did make a mistake though. I forgot to anchor the last branch which floated. I weighed it down, hoping it would get waterlogged in time. Although somewhat barren at the end of day 3, the stage for this environment was set. The established lilies were small, and the others were hidden beneath layers of sand and gravel. After 20 days had passed, the most noticeable difference was the water, which became tinted from tannins in the wood. Looking closer, it was clear that the lilies on the right had grown in, while others had withered during acclimation, and the bulbs weren't doing anything. The wood was also covered in an unsightly, but harmless mold. Other than top-offs, I hadn't done a thing on this tank yet. That had to change. 
I carefully scrubbed the branches to remove mold and excess wood pulp. I also trimmed the unsightly leaves so the plants could focus on producing new foliage. I completed the process by removing debris with a 50% water change. The water cleared up significantly a week later, but I was more excited to add another type of lily, a tiger lotus. It was then that the first inhabitant made himself known, Lars. I didn't add him, so he must have hitched a ride on a plant. This was a welcome surprise because bladder snails are beneficial. The lilies on the right looked excellent as they matured, but the others weren't doing much and still no peep from the bulbs. I decided to add more plants a few days later. That was around when the new Danio Aquarium was established and I could dismantle the old one. I got various epiphytes out of the deal that would further enhance this design. More importantly, I added the first intentional inhabitant. Frankie called Drone the Amano Shrimp. He briefly became acquainted with Lars and immediately got to work on the driftwood. After 40 long days, my patience was finally rewarded. I honestly wasn't sure what to expect from the dried bulbs, but to my surprise, a few of them began to grow. It was a beautiful sight indeed, and that wasn't all. The large plant breached the surface, putting off some impressive leaves. All of this inspired me for the setup's future. I could only hope that all of the bulbs would eventually sprout and look this good. A random piece of rickia materialized on this branch too. I have no idea where it came from because I don't have it elsewhere. Lars wasn't alone anymore either, and they were busy. Clusters of eggs were everywhere, soon to emerge as hundreds of snails. Even now the environment appeared new, but everything would change only five days later. Even more leaves made their way to the surface while the plants in the waters below were establishing well. However, with more snails running amok, there was excrement all over the hardscape. Frankie wasn't cleaning well enough, so I had to take matters into my own hands once again. That annoying branch from before gave me problems as I did maintenance, but eventually I wrangled it in and completed the task at hand. The next day I gave the plants a boost. With all the growth over the past 43 days, I figured some more nutrients would encourage this to continue. The tank was also seasoned and ready for more critters, yellow sakura shrimp and more amanos to join Frankie. I thought Samantha would befriend Lars, but she was set on finding a good snack. She and the rest of the gang made themselves at home in the plants and joined Frankie in the pursuit of cleanliness. Well, they were actually searching for food, but that's how they clean a tank. Shrimp and snails are great, but they wouldn't remain alone. Who I built this setup for were actually living in this tank. They really didn't make my job easy. I had to remove everything to round them up, and it was impossible to avoid the duckweed. I had to sift through that before this school of young glow light danios could enter their new home. I believe there were 15, and the story behind these fish is pretty cool. I got a different school of danios back in 2022. They lived in this paludarium for a few months, before moving to a different experimental setup. It succumbed to cyanobacteria, so the fish were moved to a different aquarium. However, their old tank remained vacant for three months. When I went to dismantle it for good, I noticed something astounding. What water remained housed a plethora of microscopic fish. Not all of them made it, but these are the ones that did. They're the offspring of that original set of Danios who they'd eventually be reunited with. They were understandably shy at first, but I was excited to see how they'd settle in alongside the new shrimp. Weeks later, the fish zoomed around non-stop and looked perfect in this environment. The lilies on the left still weren't doing much, and I was waiting for more to sprout, but it was maturing well. However, the ones growing up front from the dried bulbs were getting massive, alongside the tigers. The entire crew, especially Samantha, worked hard around this, but something dubious was afoot, staghorn algae. 
It likely formed due to low flow, which was an intentional choice to preserve lily foliage and the additional bioload from all the new animals. I increased the flow slightly, which I assumed would help, but what was present had to be removed. That was simple enough. However, as I addressed it, I noticed another problem. Much of the foliage on the giant lily was no longer attached to the plant. They defoliate often, so I wasn't surprised, just disappointed because the tank looked so good. That was unfortunate, but I decided to expedite the family reunion and dial it in from there. On day 79, seeing the fish colored up together in a single skull was a joy. The staghorn algae appeared to be at bay too. Frankie was growing steadily and enjoying himself while Lars raced Samantha, or so he thought. I'm pretty sure she was probably just on the hunt for food. Everything appeared as it should until something unexpected caught my eye. Ram's horn snails. I didn't intentionally add them, but I was happy to see them because they're my favorite type of snail. The lilies up front were going absolutely wild now, with many leaves breaching the surface. The rickia had multiplied up here as well, but as I looked to its right, I noticed a weird occurrence. One of the bulbs dislodged from the substrate and floated alongside dead leaves. I removed those and returned the bulb to its rightful place before another round of root tabs. A quick maintenance session was required as well. These adjustments appeared to hold up a month later, but on a closer look, the staghorn algae was gripping the landscape. Luckily, it wasn't as bad as before, mainly localized to a few unlucky leaves. Some were degrading, which I didn't think much of then, but it would come back to haunt me later. The lilies on the left were finally putting on some size, and the rickia got a mind of its own. It decided to pack up and move elsewhere. Lars hitched a ride on his new raft as I took care of business. Afterward, I didn't do much but top the tank off for about 70 days. That was the most extended period I spent without seriously maintaining this environment. Unfortunately, that allowed the staghorn algae and a few other species to become very established. They had many plants in their grips, including a random patch of java moss I didn't intentionally add. I had to get in there and give it some love because if left untreated, it would only get worse. The polluted leaves had to go, as did the rickia raft. It was shading out many of the plants below. That bulb was floating again too. I don't know why, but it just didn't want to stay put. A few weeks later, I had to do a little more maintenance to get things up to speed. I also dosed for potassium, but otherwise it was holding up. Life truly was in full effect at day 217. The entire school of Daniels, full of energy, zipped back and forth, enjoying their time together. All of the shrimp, including Frankie and Samantha, feverishly grazed on every surface in search of food. Meanwhile, Lars and his extended family began sporting a new distinguished look. However, the dominant snails of this aquarium were now the various colors of ram's horns. That kind of begs the question, where did all of these random animals and plants come from? The answer is clear, and the direct result of my decision on day 29, when I added plants from a different tank. At one point, that tank did have rickia, java moss, and many other things I didn't add here, including the newest arrival, Zeus Fosser Tong. As for the Ramshorn snails, I believe they actually snuck in with the baby Danios, but I digress. While doing maintenance the other day, I noticed several baby shrimp on the plants. I couldn't get footage then, but I thought a shrimp lolly might persuade them. Naturally, Samantha was first on the scene, but she couldn't eat in peace because the fish began swarming. I tried to keep them occupied with flakes, which initiated a feeding frenzy. That gave her and the other shrimp a moment, but it wasn't long before they'd return. 
tried to move it closer to the plants where the shrimps colonize, and this definitely encouraged others to graze, but no sign of the babies. After all this time though, it looks like Lars and Samantha are finally friends. It's funny that this all began as a silly experiment to see if dried bulbs could sprout into plants. I'm happy the answer to the question was yes, because this was a lot of fun and the animals got a good home out of the deal. A few of the lilies on the left, and all of the others in the back with pads on the surface are from those bulbs. I didn't anticipate it would take this long, but I kept pushing back the project in hopes to get all of them in sync with pads simultaneously at the surface. Unfortunately, that will likely never happen, and my attempts to fertilize it into existence instead resulted in algae. Although that has no negative effect on life within the tank, it did cause nutrient instability. Additionally, you'll see that many of the plants have pinholes, which likely indicate a potassium deficiency. That issue's been present for a while, and I didn't think much of it at first, but that's why I recently started dosing for it. Anyway, as I let it settle into normal life, so to speak, with very little fertilizing, I think most of that should subside. Plus, it's been running on a 10 hour photo period to optimize the time lapse, while most of my other tanks run on 6 hours of light. Excess nutrients and light equals algae. It's that simple. Despite all of that, I wouldn't change a thing about how this unfolded. I think it's fascinating how life finds a way, and that's the beauty of keeping an aquarium. You take one component from another, and before you know it, new life you didn't intend to add decides to take up residence. You never know what to expect from a mini ecosystem in a glass box, because like the Rikia raft and nature itself, it has a mind of its own. You may have specific goals in mind and attempt to direct certain outcomes, but inevitably, it will do what it wants. Maintaining life in an aquarium is a lot of fun. If you enjoyed this video, I've curated a few others just like it. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications if you're new here so you don't miss out on the next upload. As always, thank you for watching, and until next time, Serpa Squad, take care and peace.